This is Far From Home. I'm Scott Gurian. During this past year and a half, when I haven't been able to do much traveling, I've been keeping busy with all sorts of things closer to home, like tackling long overdue projects around the house, jogging to get some exercise, hiking to get some fresh air, and trying out new recipes in the kitchen. And during all of this, I've been listening to a lot of podcasts. As you know, if you've been a fan of the show for a while, I'll occasionally pop into your feed to share episodes from other podcasts I enjoy, and this time I'm highlighting a really cool program I recently found called Here There Be Dragons. Each season, they take a deep dive into a different global city, starting with New York and then moving on to Paris and for their latest season, Stockholm. To be clear, it's not a program about traveling or tourism. Instead, they really try to dig below the surface to capture the vibe of the city and explore what these places are like for the people who live there. And I should add that it's also really thought-provoking and beautifully produced. Before we get to the episode, I want to introduce Jess Myers, the host of Here There Be Dragons, to tell me a little bit about her show. So welcome, Jess. Hi, Scott. Thanks for having me. Sure. Uh Uh-oh, is that construction? Yes. I do live in New York, where... I have an illegal car wash in front of my building. I have just people who build furniture in front of my building, like all kinds of delights. <laughs> and I have a violinist upstairs. Ah, that's the life of the city, right? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Fits in line with the theme of your podcast. So let me start by asking you the question that I imagine many listeners might be wondering, which is about how you came up with the name Here There Be Dragons. Yeah. So essentially in early days of exploration, it was pretty common for cartographers to sit at ports and just flag people down who were coming in and out to describe what they had seen, where they had been. Out on the ships in the ocean. Yeah. So like really common in like European port cities, for example. So if you look at sort of archival maps, sometimes you'll see little like monsters drawn over regions that are not explored or that people have given reports of like, oh, this was just really dangerous and like I had a terrible time there. And there's a phrase that comes with it that goes uh, Hix and Draconis, which means here be dragons, just as a way of marking like uncertainty and like sort of warning people and things like this. And because this show came out of ideas around how do people think about their own safety in cities, We went with that title to sort of think about the way that, you know, certainty, uncertainty and security help people navigate their spaces. Kind of about fear of the unknown. Fear of the unknown, but also fear of the known as well. I think what's interesting about the podcast, too, is that there are places like, let's say, a really busy commercial district in the city where you would expect like, oh, everyone feels great here. And then you start to talk to residents are like yeah at night it's like very seedy and I hate it or during the day you're not allowed to be in that place if you don't have money and it feels like you're really unwelcome so there's always these spins on even really touristy areas for example it's like oh yeah everyone is just fine here and then when you start breaking it down a little bit more to like the politics of the city the way that people move through their cities it becomes really complicated like in this past season in one of the most touristy places in Stockholm, Gamlestan, which is like an island in the middle. A lot of older, like 40s, 50s Stockholmers that we spoke to were like, oh yeah, that's where Nazis used to hang out in the 90s, and I was never there. <laughs> which is just a huge stark contrast from walking around in that space and seeing like specialty bicycle shops and like, you know, boiled candy stores and things like this. Mm. T- tell me a little bit about your background and your interests, which made you want to start this program. Yeah. So actually, this program started as my graduate thesis work. Uh, I'm an urbanist at the base with a background in architecture as well. And something that I've been interested in for a long time is the way that things like terror and like violence and sort of rumors about insecurity or rumors about unsafety create a lot of basis for policies that tend to be kind of harmful. So things like stop and frisk were started out of the idea that like, oh, you know, young men hanging out on the streets are very dangerous. So we need to have a policy to like make ourselves feel more safe. Or even the way that my own parents would talk about New York as people who were experiencing it 
as sort of like young people in the late 70s and early 80s, New York was like this extremely dangerous, unpredictable place to them. So when I was growing up, they were like, yeah, New York, the streets are paved with murder. There are just, you know, drugs raining from the skies, like things like this. And we should explain that you, like me, grew up in the suburbs of New Jersey, not far outside of New York. So even though it's not far away, it's kind of a, a world away in some ways. Yeah. So I just got really curious about the way that people create a kind of personal cartography of their cities through these assumptions about safety and danger. And I started researching that in my grad program, like different kinds of security narratives and what they allow for, you know, essentially like city halls to get away with policy wise and also how they sort of drive the imagination of residents. So for Stockholm, for example, you have, and you know, this is not uncommon in Europe, a lot of rumors around neighborhoods that are primarily immigrant. These ideas that they're really segregated and they're very separate and they don't want to assimilate, that, you know, there's something dangerous going on there, usually narratives around drugs or weapons, not dissimilar from security sort of narratives in the U.S. around rising crime. But then when you go to those neighborhoods, they're actually the most diverse neighborhoods in Stockholm. So you can go there and hear like 80 different languages and see kids going to school together who, you know, their parents were asylum seekers from like former Yugoslavia, from Chile, from Ethiopia. (laughs) And like all of these kids go to school together and are sort of like becoming Swedish together. But that is still seen as like a segregated space, which I found really interesting even the way that those neighborhoods are talked about, they could be like in the center city and still referred to as the suburbs. So I'm always very interested in that angle, sort of how do these security narratives start to shape the way people see the city? And then if you talk to people who are kind of on the receiving end of those stereotypes, what is their security map like, their own cartography of the city like? And you, you say on your website that this started off as a reflection on the way the city takes a personal shape and size based on a person's experiences, but it became kind of a podcasting project about fear, identity, and urban life. Uh, expand on that a bit if you could and tell me what you aim to do with the show. Yeah, what I really like to do with the show is take a city that people maybe have a stereotype about, an understanding about on maybe like a tourist postcard level. A place like Paris is a really good example of this, where you're just like, ah, the city of love, you know, the city of lights, romance, the Eiffel Tower, things like this. And when you think of that city, you don't think about okay, what is the struggle of like different religious groups in the city? Or what is it to be a woman of different kinds of backgrounds there? What's it like to be queer in Paris? And like, how would you, if you have those experiences, navigate the city a bit differently? And I think this is something that you may have mentioned on your show as well, is that when it comes to travel, there's kind of a blanket assumption that everybody moves through space in the same way. You know, everybody can access space in the same way. And in our show, what we're trying to get at is that not only is that not true, but if you sort of drill down into the way that people are actually navigating space, you get some very interesting ideas about how to use space or like possibilities about how cities could be designed in different ways. I've noticed that in your three seasons so far, New York, Paris, and Stockholm, you've focused on cities in the global north. Is that an intentional decision? Yeah, absolutely. I think that as someone who studied city planning, global north cities are often used as like a finished product, you know what I mean? Like as a case study for other cities to follow. And sort of global south cities are used as this like either the idea of the developing city, the sort of sprawling, you know, urban infrastructure that's like untamed or uh, things like this. And I wanted to trouble that idea that like global north cities are these finished case studies that, you know, struggles for resources, struggles for access to space were no longer happening. But that's not true. Um, Global north cities actually have a lot of really interesting struggles that in many ways sort of reflect global politics in a lot of ways. 
So I've decided to share an episode today from your latest season that I really enjoyed. It's about this strict culture of rule following and adhering to the norms that you discovered during your time in Stockholm, Sweden. Now, I've never been there, but my perception of Sweden and Scandinavia as a whole is that it's a pretty homogeneous place. Um, As you reported, though, there's sort of a, a flip side to that story where anyone who's in any way different, whether it's through choices they make or forces beyond their control, faces this enormous pressure to sort of get in line. Do you want to say anything else about this to set things up before people listen? Yeah, um, I think why this topic stood out to me in interviews is because it's also something that we came across in the Paris season of this way that even though multiculturalism or diversity is seen as a positive thing, it's to a point. And to stand out from a certain standard of assimilation can actually be a safety issue for some people. So what I found really interesting was the way that people who stand out from those norms kind of create strategies for themselves and have these ideas about the spaces where they can completely be themselves and the spaces where to be themselves is a risk. And I think that what is helpful to sort of pull from those episodes is sort of interrogating for yourself when you're moving through space, what are the ways that I am kind of editing and curating myself as I'm walking down the street or as I'm going about my day in my city in order to kind of strategize for my own safety? And what are things that could change that maybe you wouldn't have to make all those choices, you know? Because I think for many of us, it becomes second nature to make those very quick edits like, oh, uh, I know that I'm going to walk by this construction site, so I'm deciding not to wear these heels. I'll put them on at work, you know? (laughs) And it seems very innocuous, but at the same time, it's just like, hmm, I think there's something to drill into there and also maybe different ways to make demands of our cities that would allow more ease of expression or comfort of expression. Well, Jess Myers, thanks so much for joining me. Thanks, Scott. And for my listeners, you should all go subscribe to Here There Be Dragons wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, here's the episode, and I hope you like it. Volvo Vuvevila, which is like Volvo Vuve, V-O-V-V, and then E, which is a dog. Uh, yeah. And then uh, Villa. Villa is a very like middle-class dream. Volvo Vuvevila which is like, so you have all the three things. Like you have a family with a villa, and then you have the Volvo, and then you have the dog. Stockholm is very, there are rules everywhere. Not that I'm wild. I think Stockholm is too planned and too much rules and too much structure for my taste. Welcome to Here There Be Dragons. This season, I'm taking you to Stockholm. I'm your host, Jess Myers. Episode 6, Norms. Round glasses. <laughs> Trends are so clear in, in Stockholm. Beards on the guy. Assimilation of 90% are wearing the same jacket as you. There's so much nerve everywhere. We look like soldiers, conservative. People don't want to stand out. When I'm traveling, my mom has this little accusation for me. She says, Jess, you're never happy to travel anywhere unless you can get an apartment and a part-time job. And honestly, it's kind of true. I hate being a tourist. When I travel somewhere, what I like the most is trying to figure out what it's like to just live there. Like, really live there. What is it like to be a student here? To be someone's co-worker? To be a regular at a neighborhood bar? What is it like to just be a normal, unremarkable person in any random city? That's what's fun to me. Taking a walk through a what-if. Last year, I was trying to figure out what a normal Stockholmer was. Anything people invited me to do, I did it. I went to clubs and parks, I cooked people dinner, I pushed people's strollers, I hung out. What I learned is that in Stockholm, fitting in has quite a few rules. 
For example, before I left New York, I went to a swap meet and got the warmest coat I could find, a tomato red wool-rich winter coat. When I wore it around town, I noticed my mistake right away. Everyone was in dark navy or black puffer-down jackets. That swish, 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 it's practically the city's winter soundtrack. Can I, sorry, can I just ask that you take off your jacket? Because yeah, it makes noise. Mind, not, <laughs> These look like synthetic. Cool. I was a little too moomins where I should have been Adidas. I stood out like a traffic light. Jess, my program director, would say, you always bring a lot of color. Strike one. Strike two, by Stockholm standards, I'm loud as hell, showering at 10 p.m., laughing at top volume, banging pots and pans in the communal kitchen, generally living in the key of Brooklyn. All big no-nos I usually forgot. Strike three. Unglasvatten. Unglasvatten. This one might be obvious, but after a few months on Duolingo... I still didn't speak Swedish. So at the grocery store in my building, at a thrift store, no one was really buying me as a local. In my quest to find the norm, I was sticking out most of the time. But in a way, it's easier to see the rules if you're always outside of them, even if that outsideness is an uncomfortable place to be. But knowing those rules and being able to navigate them can be a big part of feeling safe in the city. Whether newly arrived or born and bred, we'll hear from Stockholmers trying to figure out the norms, how to use them and how to change them. Will they bend to Stockholm or will Stockholm bend to them? Here's Amon. She's a Stockholm-based fashion designer with an eye for trends in the city. She clocked my look right away. In Södermalm, it's it's uh, it's like you're wearing now, like round glasses, <laughs> um, uh, chinos uh, with the pants, like uh, where they have like shorter pants, <laughs> and like beards on the guy, and like um, big coats on the women, and like a, a more relaxed kind of uh, clothes, and a lot of. Uh, People are inspired by the 20s, 50s, 60s. And you can see that on their and their style. And, you know, like, oh, this person must be from Södermalm. <laughs> Where I worked before in, in Östermalm, when I had the office there, people were more, like, not that social. And everybody, like, were the same brands and the same. So it was, like, I couldn't feel, like, inspired not from the boutiques and not from anything like it's so different from Östermalm, Södermalm, the suburbs um it's like you you got three looks in Stockholm three not more than that <laughs> uh, and it's few few people that got their own kind of style well, that's one part of what I miss living in a really global city. I don't consider Stockholm being a global city. I mean, it, trends are so clear in, in Stockholm. I mean, it just comes as waves. <laughs> you know, people have the same shoes, the same hairstyles, the same I mean, color of lipstick. It's just like so trendy. It's, yeah. I miss that a lot from like living in a really like global city. I mean, you have a lot of styles and people are have like the need to kind of express their identity, but it's it's not as as here where everybody goes in like the same waves mm -hmm. in Stockholm. And that's I think that's also like one showing that it's, it needs to grow, <laughs> not just in size, but just in like acceptance, I think. In my experience in Stockholm, at bars, on the subway, or at parties, I felt a certain reluctance to stand out. After living in New York for years, I've become pretty indifferent to strangeness. Electric purple hair and a leather chest harness gets on the train. Must be a Tuesday commute. Before, it was even worse. You could, like, go on the uh, subway on the train and, like, 90% are wearing the same jacket as you are. We look like soldiers. I don't know why. I think it's smaller and people tend to, like, lean to the safe choices. It's so dark, like, eight months a year. I think it's it's just people don't want to stand out. And it's like, if you stand out through your clothes, 
you will get attention and people are not comfortable with that. But I'm not the first one to notice the lack of strangeness in Stockholm streets. So did Susan Sontag, an artist and critic who was navigating Sweden in the 60s and 70s. A high degree of national self-consciousness is partly what you would expect of a population with the highest per capita income in the world and a strong conviction of their country's moral superiority. When you're certain everyone around you is doing the right thing, it's easy to fear that you might be the one to make the wrong move. Why should you need to stand out when fitting in works for everyone else? It's a huge trust in like the political system and, and like in the authorities and so on. And I think it's like the rebellious part. I mean, there were eras, of course, but just in general, I would say, like, people, there hasn't been any wars or, like, big catastrophes or political, like, well, now, I hope soon, now that <laughs> we're getting these uh, political parties, like, um, maybe I hope that it's going to be more, like, stronger, but, like, the rebellious kind of qualities in, in, in the nation kind of needs to get forward, I hope. I learned about Stockholm outside of Stockholm. I, I had a lot of Swedish friends as well in New York. There were a lot of Swedes in New York. There still are a lot of Swedes in New York. I think I had a different idea of what Stockholm was than what it was in reality from the people I met. Um, in terms of uh, the people I met were very lively and outgoing and slightly crazy, actually, <laughs> even for a New Yorker. And then... Uh, completely opposite to the people that I met when I when we moved to Stockholm. I, I thought people were a lot more um, conservative and a lot more guarded than, than the people I'd met before. Well, I think Stockholm is an anxious city overall. It's very uh, socially anxious. It's um, There's just so much nerve everywhere and it's, um, you know, it's calmed down. Stockholm is not so different from other big cities, where being successful means having the right job, the right clothes, and the right apartment. But as Marion said, there is a certain anxiousness about standing out that can feel palpable. If you ride the Tibana enough and hang around the city center, go around to a few art galleries, you'll pick up the pattern pretty quickly. Talk quietly and not to strangers, wear monochrome, stand on the right side of the escalator. Very well-mannered. Having the right look is one thing, but what if the things that make you stand out aren't really things that you can change? Whether it's race or queerness or religion, what happens when it's who you are that separates you from the crowd? And in a culture that values sameness, what if that makes your daily life difficult? Here's Vanessa Barker. She's a professor of sociology at Stockholm University who researches the creation of difference in Sweden. For Sweden, for most of the 20th century and now, um, they've had an assimilationist policy of immigration. So there was a very brief period where Sweden followed a multicultural idea, right, that would re respect difference, understand difference. But as an official policy, that was barely 10 years. And I think what's difficult for people who come to Sweden, right, from whatever country is that it sort of says one thing out of one side of its mouth, but the reality is actually very different. So you will find nobody in the government or even people on the street who would say, this is an assimilationist country where we expect you to follow exactly what we what we want and what we do. But that is what is actually expected, right? So there's an assumption that people would naturally want to adopt Swedish values and um, adopt cultural practices. And they're not, it's not spoken. And so you get these kinds of conflicts, right, where there's um, sometimes, well, what is actually expected? Um, what are the kind of cultural values? So what then is the difference between integration and assimilation? As Vanessa said, it gets fuzzy. Integration or a multicultural approach can be like a checklist. Speak the language, check. Know the bank holidays, check. Vote in the elections, check. All right, you fit in, and maybe even you can bring a few elements of your own culture. But assimilation is something a bit trickier. It's more like a demand. Be like us. Just like us. But who gets to be the us? 
Who gets to set the standard and what happens when you just can't be anything other than who you are? We have something in Sweden that came with the social democrats. (laughs) And it's like to be so normal as possible. Like you go to work, you go home, you like, you don't stand out in anything you do. Like you don't even say your IDs to your boss you just do your shit and then you go home like you can't even like use your voice if you use your voice you're a pain in the ass i'm sorry to use this kind of language but it's even and especially if you're a woman if you are being visible or or like you're using your voice you're just annoying until today it is like that and if you're forgen and you're muslim (laughs) You're even a bigger pain in the ass. But what are actually, right, the Swedish values that we might think of as, as operating the society? And the, in terms of the, the burden, so most of it is upon, right, people who come new into the society, even though there's an idea that Sweden is somehow welcoming to all. I, I think in practice it doesn't really work out that way. And there is a lack of understanding about um, the integration or incorporation, right, is a, is a process or a two-way street that societies change over time. So there's also this idea that somehow, there's a lot of nostalgia for the past on all sides, um, that somehow Sweden was a, has some fixed past that many people long for and want to return to. There's somehow the idea that it was better in the past. This question of assimilation and the way that the Swedish government has been unwilling to support immigrants that they perceive to be unassimilated has been a tension in Sweden for decades. In 1992, immigrants in Stockholm demanded action on a serial killer who was targeting Swedes of color. They also demanded that the government crack down on racist organizations. At the time, Prime Minister Carl Bildt gave a garbled speech hiding behind bureaucracy while never mentioning the word racism. You can hear him talking to an angry town hall in Rinkeby, where he uses phrases like which means the dynamic of opposites and which means surface frictions, neither of which make any sense in Swedish or in English. Before ending the meeting, the immigration minister at the time attempted to lead the crowd in singing We Shall Overcome. No actions were promised and no support was offered. The impulse towards assimilation is more than social. As Iman and Vanessa were saying, it's political as well. We talked before about the safety net that the Social Democrats set up and how they meticulously measured what the standard citizen might need. Uh, And when they built these working class family uh, housing, it was like this amazing welfare state achievement. It provided really high quality standard housing to poor or middle income people. It was scientifically really researched, like the kitchens, how, sh- how big should the kitchens be, the exact amount of light and space for children in the yards. The city that provides commuter tickets for dogs on trains and buses. Stockholm is probably the most law-abiding town in Western Europe, a city with many laws and restrictions reforms, protections against almost everything. What was excluded from that standard is just as important as what was included. We saw in the segregation episodes that as soon as public housing was used by people who didn't quite fit the standard, all of a sudden the safety net couldn't quite catch everyone. There's been a slumification process where as these neighborhoods have been inhabited by poorer and poorer uh, residents since the 80s or so, uh, and also to a larger extent immigrants, so non-white Swedish people, the investments aimed to you know, renovate and rebuild uh, and adjust some of the unthought aspects of these environments have been lagging behind. 
So what happens when you aren't the ones who were planned for? What happens when you're a bit too brown, too queer, too religious to quite fit in? I was only out queer kid in school, so it was quite unsafe and I felt very um, looked upon. A couple of weeks ago, one of the women said to me that she went for a walk and she lives in a central part of Southern Mom. I was more other people telling me that I did not belong like quite um, explicitly wanting me not to be there. And then she kind of, she gave off an embarrassed laugh where she mentioned I was the only one in hijab going for a walk in that area. I took a stand as a queer kid quite early. So that was something that she had noticed and became aware of. And, you know, judging from her laugh, she was a bit self-conscious about that. That's sort of where I took the area for myself and like my clothing into that. It traveled from like being a punky kid in like fifth grade up to being like wearing tights and heels and tunics with like colors and sassy things. I know there's a discrepancy of of how I'm interacted with in some of these spaces that you're talking, some of these white spaces. I can feel that there's a difference when people are just addressing me without knowing who I am, as opposed to when I say, okay, I'm a curator, I have a PhD. When I was like in eighth grade, colored my hair and had like a mohawk and all the different types of colors. And that was quite different from the way you were supposed to look in a sort of tougher outer city area as a man. When I just enter like a seminar and people don't know me, they would look at me in a strange way. But as soon as they know who I am, oh yeah, you you belong. You know? And I would have uh, quite planned out routes to like how I was going to go to school. I was quite, like, precise with what time I was going to take the train or what time I was going to take the bus. What would have happened if I, if I didn't have a title or if I didn't have a degree? I mean, what, how would that kind of play, play itself out? Today, I, feel, I felt safe walking inside of the mall because I know that there were going to be kids in certain areas outside of the mall where I couldn't go. Uh, and other days, it would be like, oh, okay, it's rainy and it's, it's windy, so I go on the outside because I know that they're not going to be hanging around there. So I really um, shifted how I walked due to where, where I knew other people would be to jeopardize my safety. Yasmin is a life coach who works with immigrant women who have experienced abuse. In her work, she has seen how her clients are marked out as different, even by the systems that are meant to support them. When we step into official spaces, offices, where there's a certain rule of conduct or there's a certain procedure that they're not familiar with and where their interaction or their ability to interact is limited because they don't have the language. There I notice how they're met, how they're perceived and how people interact with them. And I also notice how how I'm perceived when I'm with them. It's really interesting. Like if I walk in on my own, because I've lived in Sweden and Stockholm all my life, I know the social codes and I know how to interact with someone and I know how to signal my privilege and in that way leverage a certain power position for myself. When I walk in with these women, I try to use my privilege and my power position to leverage on behalf of them. But it's very interesting to see how the perception of them is uh, reflected onto me. So the person that we meet might assume that uh, I've also been subjected to domestic violence, for example, because I am a woman of color, I'm a black woman, and I'm walking in with this black woman or this other woman of color or this woman in hijab, and we are placed in the same category. So I sense a shift in how people interact with me when I move with them. And that gives me just, you know, that gives me a little window into what it's like for them to move around this space in this city. More than the discomfort of not fitting in, many residents also feel the violent pressure to conform. When they're unable or unwilling to comply, public space can become a vulnerable and even dangerous place to be. My friend used to live in an area called Rondal. It is right around here. I went to her place Um, to stay there one night it was like 11 o'clock and the train station the platform was empty I got off the train and then I was tripped by somebody 
like as I was walking ahead, somebody tripped me from the back and I looked. I was so shocked. And then he just told me, hey, you, like, look where you're going. And I was like, but he's behind me. Like, why, how am I supposed to look where I'm going? I'm going forward. So he was some old Swedish guy. And we were, when we were going up the escalator, I told him that, uh, what, what, why did he do that? I was like, are you a racist? Why are you doing that? He's like, ah, oh, don't even address me, you Muslim whore. That's what he called me. He was so angry. I got so scared. I was like, this guy, he might just do something. I need to, like, I waited for him to leave the train station. I stood next to the counter where they sell the tickets. And I was just like, I don't feel safe going out as long as he's around. So I just waited for him to disappear. Stayed in the train station for like 20 minutes and then left. I didn't even say anything. I was so shocked. I just stood there. I was like, at least if something happens, he can see. But I didn't like raise the alarm or say anything. I was just like, I didn't know how to react. You know, when you're in this situation, you don't really know what to do. Yeah, so Hondal, I would say. I started going there when I was going to visit my friend during the day when people are around because I had bad experience that time, like during the night. The center is also, every now and then you get things shouted at you. There was a guy who told me, he, he, who asked me why I was wearing a rug on my head. <laughs> He's just like, why are you wearing a rug on your head? I was like, because I want to. And it's not a rug, it's, it's a scarf. So that was around the center. And then um, there was a woman one time on the train. She was screaming stuff at me, but I didn't know the language at that time. But there's a guy who stood between us. He was so angry. And he's like, I'm so sorry. He started speaking Swedish. I'm like, I don't speak Swedish. And he's like, I apologize. I'm glad you didn't understand what she's saying. And he's like, if you want, we can change, um, what do you call, carts. And he's like, I was like, okay. So I don't know what she said, but it's probably something horrible. Not all instances of violence are as physical and in-your-face as shoving and name-calling. The subtle microaggressions that gatekeep public behavior can also be blaring signals that you don't belong. The obvious, right-in-your-face, confrontational type of, uh, I don't want to call it negativity, hatred, I don't know what it is. I, that's just a few incidents, but like the more subtle like, uh, not obvious type of uh, prejudices. That one I face all the time. Um, yeah, and then sometimes I question myself. I'm like, is it just in my head? Am I thinking about this the wrong way? Or is this really how this was meant to come out, you know? So I can give you an example. There was a time I went to the, it was like a makeup uh, shop, and I took a foundation and I was like, yeah, I want to take this foundation. And he put it on my skin and he's like, this will this will just make you darker. You don't want to be darker. <laughs> I was like, okay. He's like, you should take a, a different color that either your tone a little bit lighter because this will just make you more darker, dull. I was like, okay. Yeah, so maybe I like to think he was saying it because he thought it would just make me, I'm like, I saw the undertones of that. In the interviews for Stockholm, but also in Paris and New York, I found that as soon as a resident understands that they stand out in some way, possibly in a way that makes them vulnerable to unwanted attention, they find strategies to shield themselves from that scrutiny. One of the strategies that Stockholmers, and again, specifically Stockholmers of color, had was language knowing when to code switch between different types of Swedish or even different languages helps some residents control when to blend in and when to stand out. Without a doubt. Depending on who I'm talking to, if I'm going to the bank or if I'm having uh, a meeting or just a simple interaction with anyone in a position of power and I want to assert myself or... I want to communicate clearly that I'm someone that they need to respect. I choose my words, literally. I choose my big words. I choose my articulate words. And, I, you know, I choose classic old Swedish phrases just to, like, flash all that privilege. Well, very much my grammar. I think of, like, 
um, you know, how we how we express ourselves. Like I express myself in a more old school way. Uh, you can, for example, say ni instead of du. Ni. Um, ni. And ni is... Du. Ni can be like plural form of you, which is... Du. Du, singular form of, of you. Or it can be a singular form of you, but very old school. Not really used that much these days. More formal expressions to as a way to demand respect. They use more um, slangs from other uh, languages, especially from languages that you know a lot of people speak in those areas, like Rinkeby Svenska. It's called, and that is seen as, of course, you know, not high class. It's you know, bad. You know, they get a specific uh, image of you if you speak that, but in the inner city, it's more clean Swedish, as they say, ren svenska. Like the words they use is different uh, expressions. It's more traditional Swedish language. And most of them I was not familiar with when I grew up. Rinkeby svenska is a form of Swedish slang popularized in immigrant neighborhoods like Rinkeby. It mixes Swedish, Turkish, Arabic, and other languages into casual Swedish. In a short film called Rinkeby Svenska by Bahar Paris, a group of white advertising directors attempt to coerce a black Swedish actress into this slang to appeal to immigrant audiences. Ludmilla, har du listan? Jag tror vi måste utgå från den i alla fall. Here you can hear them reading off a list of slang. Aina, Aksa, Aide, And here you can hear her discomfort. Rinkeby svenska. Menar du? Also, jag aldrig varit Rinkeby och det finns ju typ. Yeah, so in the beginning of my life, I talked a lot Rinke, Rinkeby svenska. But then I got used to talking like more Rien Svenska. And I found that when I, whenever, so when I like started a school in Vasastad and I lost contact with all of my old friends from Tiensta. So I, I didn't hang much in Tiensta after that, after like, you know, 13 years old. Uh, but I found that whenever I wasn't, you know, I was walking home in Tiensta and I saw an old friend or someone I knew, I would like switch to Rinkeby Svenska and talk with the R's a little bit harder, for example. And that continued like many years. And it was, it's like only recently, the last couple of years, I haven't been switching that hard. Both feels comfortable, but I think like now the Rien Svenska is more comfortable for me because I'm so used to it. But when I switch to like maybe a more loose form of Swedish, it's it's not that hard as before. In the U.S., the term code switching is used to describe the different strategies that people may use to feel more comfortable or integrated in a social context. It's a way of signaling, hey, I belong here, do not question it. It's things like wearing the heels in the corporate office that you snatch off as soon as you get in the elevator. It's all the honorifics that you use with your teachers and immediately getting casual with your friends. It's straightening your hair to go to school and then wearing it out as soon as you get home. 
These sound like small things, but for some residents, usually those put in minority positions, the ability to code switch means the difference between getting the job or not, getting pulled aside by the police or not, being followed home in the street or not. While code switching can offer safety, it can also be exhausting. It means that you're constantly on your toes and never fully relaxed. That's why it's also important to residents to build their own codes that they can use no matter where they are or who they're with. Michael and Andrea are curators at the Ethnographic Museum in Stockholm, and they both have Jamaican backgrounds. If you're a subscriber, you'll remember them from this week's mini-episode. In their work at the Ethnographic Museum, they curate programs to discuss ethnicity, race, and identity in Sweden. I think we are important for people who, again, the air quotes, uh, newer Swedes, who are trying to find identity in being Swedish and being of Sweden and not of Sweden because they are of Sweden but they're always asked to identify themselves as being not of Sweden so I think for the people who are who are trying to bridge that hybrid that gap it's a place like this is very important for them because it roots them in a in a longer Swedish history than the right wing will give them access to and also it helps with them finding out about the otherness in themselves as well in, in relation to being a Swede. I think it's a very, very important point. And um, for instance, while we are using the term Afro-Swedish, um, when we look at things like Afro-Swedish history, and that means sort of the history of people of African descent in Sweden. So why we're using the term Afro-Swedish is it's a di- direct challenge to the idea of ethnic Swedes. So ethnic Swedes being white. So that's kind of a challenge to that, to actually say that there are people of African descent here that are Swedish. That's why we're using that term. So, and I think, so that's kind of a, it's a, it's a very, it's a politically conscious yeah. decision to do that. Yeah. Um, I also wonder if the term ethnic Swede also opens up the opportunity to turn an ethnographic analysis onto whiteness. So if you are distinguishing yourself in a certain way and sort of putting a boundary around sort of what Swedish identity is, it also opens you up to be examined. And I'm wondering if if that conversation has also been raised at at the museum here. I think so. And I think the conversation has been raised. I know I've asked the question, if this is a museum of ethnography and definition of ethnic, why is there nothing Swedish here? And that's when I got the thing that, okay, it's been, you know, separated so yeah the historic museum and the national museum and, and all of that so 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 the actual um ethnic swede part of it is taken out from our museums except maybe the sami and that's um that's a whole other question as well you know when when you start talking about this idea of of who's swede and who's ethnic and when did that begin and how do you define it and where is it going so so it's I think it's just a lot more questions than answers at the moment. I think the main problem for me with eth- the term ethnic Swede is that it kind of erases race, that it doesn't really include race. So it tries to sort of um, take race out of the equation while still retaining it. So it's, 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 I think it's a really dangerous and very, you know, it's a very sly use of a, of a concept in a way. The, that I think it's very it's extremely problematic. In Stockholm, I never quite fit in or even could fit in, but I had certain privileges that could guard me against exclusion. Being considered an international artist or living in the center of town, I could pass off many of my faux pas as quirky and mysterious. However, not everyone gets to have those options, and a misstep can find some residents without the tools they need to live a secure life in the city. But these standards do more than just restrict the individual and how they live. In the next episode, we'll be looking into how social structures impact families in the city. What happens to the oldest, the youngest, and the most vulnerable among us, especially when we're tied together as a unit? Join us next time for Family. If you liked this episode, you might also enjoy episode five from our last season on Codes in Paris. We found that those two episodes really speak to each other. 
We are produced with the generous support of the Graham Foundation for the Advanced Studies in the Fine Arts and Konstnarsnamden, the Swedish Arts Grants Committee. Thank you to our senior producer, Adelie Pajman ponte and our team of graduate assistants from the Architecture Department at the Rhode Island School of Design. Kimberly Ayala Nahira. Bilal Ismail Ahmad. Daniel Guerrero. Uthman Aloa. Fatu Kamara consults for the show, Corey Jacobs does the music, and Adrian Lilly is our sound designer. Special thanks to Mimi and Noaha for voicing Susan Sontag. If you're not a Patreon subscriber yet, what are you waiting for? Support your friendly neighborhood urbanism podcast and get some beautiful stickers as well as exclusive mini episodes. On social media, we're at dragons underscore podcast. Or check out our website and newsletter, all full of fun content like readings, maps, and videos. If you have a comment or a question, record it and send it to us at htbdpodcast at gmail.com. You might end up on the show. And lastly, but certainly not least, rate and review us anywhere you stream us, Five Shining Stars. It really helps the show. Thanks again so much to Jess, her producer, Adelie, and the rest of her team for sharing their episode with us. If you enjoyed it as much as I did, you can subscribe to Here There Be Dragons wherever you get your podcasts. I've also linked to their website in my show notes. As for me, Far From Home will be back in a few weeks. I'm Scott Gurian. Thanks for listening.